We combined some of the most horrifying cave diving disasters we've ever covered in this video. Divers who fought to find their way out after taking the wrong turn to divers who got lost in the silt. If you like what you see, then subscribe to our channel so you may see more thrilling cave diving experiences. Eight experienced cave divers entered the Sac Acton Cenote on October 17, 1990 with the goal of exploring this incredible cave network. However, they encountered a horrible scenario and fought to escape. Are you enjoying our tales about cave diving but haven't subscribed yet? Please think about following our channel. The Sac Acton System, which the Mayans also called White Cave, is located 15 kilometers from Tulum. The longest subterranean cave system in Mexico and the second longest in the entire globe is this one. This aquatic system stands out due to the over 248 cenotes that are buried within it. This extensive cave system is made up of cenotes, which are sinkholes used as the cave's entrance. Among others, the Sac Acton and Cenote Dos Odos are located here. Animal fossils are abundant in the Sac Acton, demonstrating the well-preserved history that has been here for many centuries. The cave acquired the moniker Pet Cemetery as a result. The public has access to the cenotes of the Sac Acton, where they can savor the glistening waters and take in the splendor of nature. Numerous visitors to the Sac Acton cenote have gone diving, snorkeling, or swimming, as appropriate. Divers have already investigated and explored nearly 215 miles of the cave systems, where they have found preserved ages worth of ancient relics. Giant sloths, clay pots, jewelry, mammoths, and other extinct species are among the archaeological artifacts found here. A group of eight divers arrive at the parking area four miles north of Tulum, Yucatan, Mexico, about 10.30 a.m. on October 17, 1990. The Sac Acton Cenote was the destination on the fifth day of a six-day tour that these experienced cave divers had planned for group diving. A detailed diagram of the cave system that will direct their exploration and the diving strategy were both decided upon. Entering the Sac Acton Cenote, exploring the cave, and leaving by the Grand Cenote had been the plan. The trek would take 22 minutes and reach the sea at a depth of 40 feet. They also had to cross a brief 21-meter gap line marked with a pink direction line sign at the start, which was around 85 meters upstream from Sac Acton. This was done so that it could be connected to the long line that runs downstream to the Grand Cenote. The temporary line would be installed by the lead divers who had now been split into two teams of four divers each. The second crew reeled in the makeshift line as the first party reversed their route to Sac Acton. They would assemble at Sac Acton, dive via a different tunnel, and emerge at a third cenote via a formation room and a loop in the channel. Despite only lasting 24 minutes, the first leg went smoothly. To guide them down to the cave's tunnel, a second line was installed and extended into the Grand Cenote's expansive cavern zone. They all took a 15-minute break at the water's surface after reaching it, using that time to review their dive strategy twice. They also went ahead with a drawing on a dive slate meant to serve as a reminder for everyone in the cave structure because they knew anyone may forget. Third-party analysis of the approach was conducted since one of the team members was having trouble understanding the entire plan. This time, everyone concurred that they were free, so they returned to the cave system after descending. When they discovered a crocodile skeleton in one of the underground zones, they initially ran into a setback in their strategy. After that, a second delay occurred when a first team member dropped his mask and was saved by a second team member. The second group dove right behind them by about 100 feet, reeling in the cavern zone line. They regrouped and continued into the collapse zone. The pink direction line marking we previously mentioned, or 70 feet, is where the first team leader let go of the reel. He was also moving the other three members of his team forward. Shortly later, the second team arrived. The second team's second three members started swimming across the entire chasm while the fourth member was given the reel and instructed to reel it in. The first team leader then jumped forward to reunite with his team. At the other end of the 21-meter gap, he first rejoined his squad before taking the necessary rapid left turn and arriving at Sac Acton. When he turned to look, he saw one of the second team's members following, while the others had already reached the pink marker. They began to approach Sac Acton, but were unable to observe any following lights. They assumed that the second team's inability to be seen was the result of a jammed reel. They thought that they could quickly resolve that as a group and depart. They carried out the plan put forward by their group and moved on to the third part of the exploration. They found their way to the third cenote via navigating. The first team's captain, however, was worried about the second group and inquired of the other divers as to when they had last seen them while on the dive. After lengthy deliberation, they all came to the conclusion that the prior occurrence occurred at the pink marker. The first team leader then instructed the other three to stay put before leaving to look for the second team. 
He continued to the pink marker because the second team wasn't at the sack Acton. The gap line reel had been switched at the pink spot, he realized after he arrived. He next made the decision to visit the Grand Cenote, but it was also deserted. The gang then returned to sack Acton after he returned to the third Cenote and located them. Then for a second search, he entered by himself in the direction of Grand Cenote. The second team ran into several issues in the interim. When the leader returned, the real diver on the second team had about one-third of the line reeled in, and he requested that he replace it. They then swam back to the pink point when the leader made a right turn and descended further into the cave network. The other divers, including the team member who was introduced after the first team, followed their leader without question. The leader checked his air supply and took a quick break before starting the descent. The leader stopped and asked his teammates using his slate why they hadn't seen the first team after diving about 1,000 if in this turn they took. They made the decision to go back then. They quickly became aware of a snap and gap line to the right. They continued on it, thinking it would take them to the third cenote, but after 100 feet, they noticed a line arrow pointing away from them. Then they turned around and continued applying the fundamental principles. One diver's fin strap came off during this time, prompting a lengthy delay as his teammates helped him. Despite being the new adjustable type, the fins had been properly fixed. They eventually became concerned because it had been a while since they had seen a direction arrow. This was strange. Now that they were swimming quickly, the two in the back passed their teammates. They moved so quickly that they kicked up some silt and disappeared from view. The two who were currently in the rear started sharing air after one of them rushed out. They were around 600 feet distant from Sack Acton at this time. They gave up since swimming became more difficult as the fin strap kept falling off. They also dropped a camera, then swam for another 200 feet. The first team's leader saw three lights coming at him as he was traveling to Grand Cenote. As he swam approached the first two of the three lights, he observed that they were exchanging air. These two were sending out band signals, which indicates that serious disaster is brewing behind them. The first team's leader entered the cave underwater and discovered a body hanging from an airspace in the roof. It was way too buoyant for him to draw it to give it air. He cleared the air from his regulator, letting it flow into his pocket. The diver was gasping for oxygen as he placed his palm within the air pocket and touched it. It was still warm. When he realized this, he placed his long hose second stage regulator into the air pocket, at which point the diver grabbed it. After about a minute of breathing, the diver left the air pocket. The first team leader took the victim's face mask off and put it in his right hand while using his left. The sufferer cleared it and put on the mask. The victim was then led 150 feet to the water's surface by the first team leader, who took his right hand. The air that the two second team divers used to breathe together allowed them to reach the surface just before it ran out. The other three members of the initial team had already returned to the surface in the interim. The second squad was missing one more member who had yet to surface. The first team leader and another member of the first team then returned to the cave to look for the final team member. The last member was later located 20 feet away from the location of the first victim, who got out alive. He was discovered lying on his back on the floor, his regulator hanging out of his mouth. In an effort to save the victim's life, the first team leader and the other diver promptly put one of the regulators into his mouth. Unfortunately, they got no response. They hauled the victim out of the sack Acton's cenote while tightly gripping the body. The sufferer received mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation for five minutes, but it was unsuccessful. He had passed away. He had passed away in the sack Acton cenote's water. Each diver had a complete cave certification. The second team captain or another member of the second team or both might have been the deceased victim. He reportedly completed 53 dives in caves. There was one constant during the entire dive. Disorientation was the only factor that appears to have contributed to this disaster, which was most likely brought by by being unfamiliar with the cave. A minor error or loss of orientation while cave diving might lead to life-threatening circumstances. The two pals in today's tale went diving at Lake Apapa. They overshot their mark and were forced to deal with the effects of one of the riskiest cave diving scenarios, kicking up silt. Kevin, the subjects of this narrative are James Goki and Daniel Eugene Smith. Freshwater Lake Apapa is located in the U.S. state of Florida's Orange and Lake Counties. It is the fourth largest lake in the state, covering a total area of 30,800 acres, 125 kilometers. The main water sources for this freshwater lake are rainfall, springs, and storm runoff. Through the Apaca Buclair Canal, the lake is connected to Lake Buclair and Lake Dora to the north. The north shore of Lake Apapa is a popular location for outdoor enthusiasts thanks to its trails, observation tower, and original pump house. One of the best spots in the world to watch migratory birds is Lake Apapa, which is home to 400 different species of birds. 
A well-liked attraction, the Wildlife Drive spans the eastern 11 miles of Lake Apaca's North Shore and it includes an audio tour so that visitors may unwind and take it all in. The stunning views of Lake Apapa would also inform viewers about the lake's change to get rid of pollutants from humans. The Apapa Lake Beauclair Canal was built in the 1880s as a part of a bigger endeavor to alter Lake Apapa's northern coast. A levee constructed in 1941 to facilitate agriculture would drain 20,000 acres 81 kilometers, of wetlands from the northern end of Lake Apapa, which was once 50,000 acres 202 kilometers, in size. Fish populations declined and algae blooms were caused as a result of the farm's wastewater. As a result of the Tower Chemical Company's massive DDE spill into the river in 1980, more damage was done. Upon learning of this, the U.S. EPA promptly ordered the company to suspend operations and started a significant lake cleaning. Even small amounts of contaminated water leaking into Florida's rivers would cause permanent harm to the state's wildlife. Alba blooms have been an issue in Lake Apapa since 1991, when the group Friends of Lake Apapa was established to find the cause of the phosphorus leaks. The success of the initiative depended heavily on the implementation of the Lake Apapa Restoration Act, which held the farmers accountable for any phosphorus leak. The wetland areas along the northern bank of the river may also be rebuilt with the approval of Street Johns River Water Management. Gizzard shads excrete 175 tons of nitrogen and 58 tons of phosphorus, according to a 2002 report to the district's governing board. A vent that leads into Apaka Spring is located on the lake's southwest side, about 45 feet (13.7 meters) below the water's surface. The vent hole narrows into the limestone for 16 feet (4.8 meters) before sloping northward at roughly 45 degrees to a depth of 90 feet or 27.4 meters, providing hazardous diving conditions. Despite the fact that divers at Lake Apapa routinely dive at this opening, this is not where the current narrative starts. The divers of today were just to the east of Apapa Spring and the Gordneck Springs. Kevin James Goki, 34, and Daniel Eugene Smith, 25, went scuba diving in Apapa Spring on Tuesday, July 4, 1995. Together with their companions, they took a boot trip to Gordneck Springs. Kevin and Daniel prepared their diving gear before beginning their dive into the frigid spring seas. Due to the 45 minutes of oxygen they had on them, they assured their companions that they wouldn't be under for too long. After an hour had passed without Kevin and Daniel returning to the surface, their pals became concerned and called the sheriff's office. Local cave rescue and recovery divers Jim Calvin and Mark Long were contacted after local officials recognized they lacked the necessary training for the retrieval attempt. At this point, Mark had over 800 cave dives under his belt and had been certified in cave diving for 14 years. Following Kevin and Daniel into the lake, Mark and Jim dove into the water. They ultimately made it into the little cave and found Daniel and Kevin's bodies. The men were united, just inside a small gap between several boulders leading into the cave, floating in 96 feet or 29 meters of water. Jim declared, What transpired during this brief dive into Kevin and Daniel's lives? After removing the remains from the water, Jim and Mark stated that it was evident that Daniel and Kevin were only certified open water divers. They were not certified cave divers. The area where these individuals drowned is not somewhere that most people would go since it is silty and constricting, Mark added. For those of you who don't know what silty circumstances are in pitch black caves, stirring up silt can quickly become a life-threatening situation. It is quite difficult to tell which way is up or down because the visibility might soon decrease to nothing. There are just two options for surviving in this situation. Either use your guidance or attempt to maintain composure under pressure. Cave divers are obliged to erect a guideline before entering a cave. It's the only thing that will let you know where to go when you're ready to go. It's easy to get lost underwater, so you don't want to waste any of your precious seconds or minutes trying to figure out where you are. Popular caves occasionally, but not usually, may have set permanent guidelines imposed by previous divers. The standing rule may still be in effect, but you can never be certain of its scope. The line of sight was frequently laid by cave divers, who then removed it before departing. As previously indicated, Kevin and Daniel lacked the credentials for cave diving. They therefore lacked a guideline probably due to their lack of expertise. They may have been stirring up silt when they became disoriented in the pitch black tunnel, panicked and drowned. This tragedy emphasizes the importance of preparation and equipment before exploring underground. Mark Long also saw that only a few lights were being carried by Kevin and Daniel. Cave divers should always carry three or more flashlights with them in case one is accidentally dropped, the batteries die, or the bulbs burn out. Additionally, cave divers often only use a third of their oxygen when entering and leaving a cave. In case of a crisis, the additional third is kept on hand. 
Kevin and Daniel didn't have a backup regulator, which each diver carries in case their primary one breaks. The killings of Kevin and Daniel were absolutely avoidable and unnecessary. Given that none of them had any prior expertise in such caverns, they shouldn't have entered them. According to local press sources, one of the men had only registered six dives overall and was a recently licensed diver, but it is unclear which one. Many divers think that after earning their open water certification, they should pursue a cave diving certification, but this isn't necessarily the case. Simply put, it depends on a number of factors, such as your background, skills, and emotional stability. Diving in confined areas like caves is significantly different from diving in the open ocean. These kinds of mishaps are completely avoidable if you stay within the guidelines that were given to you. In today's cave diving tale, one of the most terrifying situations that a cave diver may encounter is losing sight of a team member in one of the world's most hazardous cave diving locations. Make sure to finish the audio if you want to fully understand this horrific tale. Amy Maria Arage, who went scuba diving in the Grand Cenote, is the tragic subject of this story. Southeast Mexico's Tulum is approximately 3 miles, 5 kilometers, from this cave. Grand Cenote is a moderately accessible place for snorkeling and swimming into the caverns for a breathtaking view of the light beams, striking the water through the cave opening and exploring the rock formations. Divers can explore the rock formations through a network of white walled tunnels. This cenote is really composed of several smaller ones that meander through the lush forest floor and are connected by wooden pathways. The Maya civilization is claimed to have placed a high value on cenotes. In addition to being their main source of water, cenotes were also believed to be entrance to the Xatbalba or underworld and a location frequented by the Mayan gods, particularly Chik, the god of rain, lightning, and thunder. Your sense of direction may be affected by the cenotes' extremely dark areas. The Grand Cenote has already taken five lives. Amy Maria Ariaga, a citizen of Bakersfield and a qualified teacher, was born on December 17, 1977. She was always prepared to dive. Since she was a small child, she had only occasional divers for friends. In Wasco, Amy taught for 13 years. For the past three years, she has taught science and English to 7th graders in grades 5 and 6. Her students said she was really inspirational. It was obvious how devoted she was to her family. Because Amy's heavenly mother, Mary Ariaga, passed away two years ago on October 18, she visited her father's home every day to see how he was doing. After her mother passed away, Amy made sure her father, Tom Ariaga, felt loved and cared for. She regularly spoke about her father to all of her friends and was really proud of him. Amy and Alessandro Morano went on a fun dive in the Sac Acton Cave Network on November 26, 2016. The Grand Cenote was the starting point, and that is where they would finish. To document her dive and show her friends and family back in the United States what she was doing, she requested Alessandro to shoot pictures and films of her. Her open water side mount course, the full cave course, a day of intro to cave course refresher training, and all of the cave course dives were all taught by Alessandro. On November 24, 2016, she finished the training with an excellent performance. Just to refresh your memory, she finished her training two days prior to the dive we will be talking about. It was explained and agreed that Amy would always be diver number one for this dive in the Sac Acton cave system, regardless of whether the loop was finished in a single dive or not. Following the upstream line, they were to use a reel to connect to the Kuzana loop line and then another jump to the right to connect to the end of the loop line, as was agreed upon by both parties. They decided to eliminate the jump and go along the line to the exit if they used the rule of thirds to get to the Kuzana leap line. During the dive briefing, Alessandra did remind Amy how they would go on the circuit. Much as she had rehearsed on the circuit in Cenote Minotauro on November 23, one of the final days of her cave training, Amy was also informed by Alessandro that divers could always utilize the Cenote Hodel, which is near to the start of the Cusana Loop Gap as an emergency exit, and that the Cenote could be found by the natural light coming through the Cenote entrance. Another little Cenote called No Name is located further ahead and to the left. It is not as visible from the line as Cenote Hodel, but it can be seen by covering the primary lights. During planning, they decided on a maximum depth of 40 feet, 12 meters, and if they didn't reach their jump reel, which was placed at the start of the loop, using one-third of their gas, they would turn around and exit the cave using the same line. Amy did check the pressure in her tank and recorded the return pressure, anticipated time, and depth on her slate. As Alessandra was making the films for her, Amy agreed to be the dive leader for the duration of the dive once they completed their gear check on the surface. In fact, the plunge started at 11.26 a.m. since they were the first team to enter the cave and there was no other line linked to the cave line prior to theirs, Alessandro put their primary reel from open water around the cavern line to prevent disturbing the subterranean tours. 
As decided upon during the pre-dive preparations, Alessandro strung the cookie from the rope and gave it in the order to take over as leader. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term cookie, it refers to a personal marker, also known as a Ryan marker, that is positioned on the line that divers use between crossings. It serves as a check to make sure the team leader doesn't leave anyone behind. A few minutes later, when they reach the arrows pointing in both directions, where the line makes a 90-degree angle and the Paso del La Garto Leap is located, they deposited a cookie certifying their exit. Around minute 25 into the dive, they finally made it to the line gap and Alessandro showed Amy the natural light coming from the Cenote Hotel at that time. Alessandro gave her the go-ahead signal after verifying her air supply, depth, and time. She did ask for the gap after checking her air supply, depth, and time. Amy filled in the space and Alessandro added a cookie bearing his initials, AM, after canceling the arrow at the line's end and beginning to lay the line in the direction of Cusa Na Loop, Amy filled in the space and added a cookie. After some time, they came to the loop jump. Amy again assessed the air pressure, depth, and time at the loop jump before asking Alessandro for permission to leap to which he consented. Before the cave arrows, Amy put his second white arrow bearing her name, this time with her leap orange line connected. They started to follow the line loop counterclockwise after she linked her line directly to the end or start of the loop line installed a cookie, and waved OK to Alessandro. When they reached the double arrow pointing the closest road out, Alessandro asked Amy for her pressure to evaluate whether they needed to mark it or whether they could complete the circle in a single dive. She retorted, her pressure was between 2300 and 2200 pounds per square inch. She gave her the go-ahead to carry out the pre-dive plan as planned because Alessandro's pressure was similar. Alessandro attempted to get her attention so he could record a video of her as they passed the cenote no name sign. To view and capture on camera the natural light flowing from the cenote, he nevertheless covered the lights. The cave line and no-name cenote were then located on the left and right, respectively. Alessandro couldn't see Amy or see her light when he turned around, even though she was between him and the wall. Alessandro did swim around a formation blocking his view, anticipating seeing Amy immediately around the formation, making a 90-degree turn in a line. Alessandro continued forward, thinking Amy was in front as she wasn't visible to her. Even though Amy had followed the jump line out and left the leap to be recovered by Alessandro as intended, she was still nowhere to be found when they got to our jump line. For two to three minutes, Alessandro waited for another opportunity to lay his line, but she was nowhere to be seen. Alessandro did, however, retrieve the markers and the line because she was certain she was in front. She should not continue looking for too long because the other diver would typically be outside, as they just mentioned in her training, and she should never risk her safety. They had a second jump reel with a yellow line installed next to theirs on the jump, and they were both connected to the opposing team's REM marker, or cookie. Alessandro made a serious error by taking both the cookie and the reel off. He knew in his mind she was ahead of him at the moment. The primary reel remained in place as Alessandro withdrew the gap reel and cookie. He did this because he needed to know right away if Amy was okay outside because he hadn't yet caught up with her. To find Amy, Alessandro returned to the surface. He thought Amy was nearby when he saw some lights outside the lake, but it was only another couple getting ready to jump in. They said that they had seen a girl when Alessandro asked them if they had seen a blonde woman wearing a blue helmet. They demanded to take the shortcut that led to a hotel in the cave after asking where she went. Alessandro immediately descended there, but when he reached the entrance to the cenote and searched for her, he couldn't find her. Alessandro got out of the water and started hunting for people who had tanks he could borrow. He grabbed his cell phone and attempted to call a fellow diver named Fernando, but the call was unsuccessful. He then put down his cell phone, picked up his keys with the help of a guide, and obtained one of his tanks. The left tank had a pressure of 3,000 pounds per square inch, and the right tank was provided by one of the team members who he asked for Amy on the shortcut. At this point, it was approximately 1.47 p.m. Around 2.13 p.m., he entered by himself. He connected the gap, jumped, and then took the identical path that Amy had planned, posting the markings, this time using a permanent marker. Just as Amy had intended, he circled the loop in the opposite direction. He found Amy's body lying on her back at the line, face up, after the constraints, very close to Sinod's no name, with one of her cookies placed next to her. The tanks were empty, the regulator was not in her mouth, but the mask was on. In an effort to force air down, Alessandro unhooked her mouth and placed his long hose into her mouth. She remained silent, but had some foam coming from her mouth. She wasn't responsive after Alessandro pulled her head out of the water in the sand, took off her helmet and mask, and tried to revive her. When the two backmount divers came, one of them also tried CPR. Then a third diver showed up at the side mount and announced that he was a former rescue diver who was looking to help. While the other guys moved the equipment out, he offered directions and urged Alessandro to follow him. 
He began to sink when he reached the leap and one of Amy's fins became hooked up in the cave line. The diver was then urged to follow Alessandro and let him handle the body. After 35 minutes of diving, Alessandro returned the body to the Grand Cenote after getting his approval. While his fellow teachers waited, Alessandro called the police, handed the body over to them and then waited to provide a statement. Police arrived, removed the body and then had it autopsied. Alessandro was questioned and provided with the proper answers. As the inquiry progressed, it became clear that Amy had strayed from her intended course and wound up in a pitch black cave. She attempted to return the way she came but got lost again because there was no light. Her oxygen level in the tank fell, and she was gone for good after a while. It had been 20 minutes before Alessandro saw her lifeless body. Agnes Maluka's story is sad, but we can take comfort in the fact that she got to be a cave explorer, which was her dream. Tank Cave is one of the best of the many caves near Mount Gambier. Agnes was trying to figure out what was in the cave until she died too soon. Tank Cave is called that because there is a water tank right on top of the entrance. It is in mid to Gambier, which is in South Australia. Because the entrance is underground, you have to climb down a short ladder to get into the cave. This entrance is closely watched by the Cave Divers Association of Australia. Tank Cave is a rare gem and divers enjoy swimming through it. The cave has a small opening, but it leads to a large maze-like system with over 23,000 feet 70, 10 meters of passages that divers can swim through. It also has a lot of tunnels on the sides. The cave isn't very deep. Its deepest point is about 65 feet, 20 meters. Its water is so clear that you can dive through it with no trouble and see everything. Tank Cave is one of Australia's longest underwater caves and most of it is connected by a fixed line. But there was one thing about the cave that made it very dangerous. Its system is very complicated and looks like a wild spider web. Cave divers must go through the step-by-step -step guide to learn about the cave before they can go in. This is to avoid accidents. For a dive in Tank Cave to go well, all the rules must be followed correctly. It's amazing that many things have been found in Tank Cave, but there's still so much more to find there. But the old saying goes, the more you look into this cave, the less you can see. As you go deeper into this cave, you will start to learn more about it. Divers who want exciting but risky adventures should always go to the cave. This is because the cave had tight rules and it was hard to see inside because there wasn't much room for the body. Some parts of the cave are so tight that some explorers may have to pull their tanks out of the way to get through. The fact that the cave is closed in isn't so great because the roof and walls are so soft and squishy. So big pieces of the roof fall on divers as they take a breath. This changes the way the water looks, making it hard to see clearly. Agnes Maloka was a woman with a lot of drive who explored caves all over the world. She was born in Australia on December 23, 1981. Agnes was a very skilled diver. She had certifications like Paddy Open Water, Advanced Open Water and Rescue, CDAA Advanced Cave, TDI Advanced Trimix, and many more. She never wanted to be a technical diver, but she said everything just happened on its own. She followed her passion into the deepest waters and caves where she felt the best of herself. This led her to become a technical diver. She was also a cave explorer, an author, an underwater photographer, and a maritime archaeologist. Agnes took part in many international diving projects and documentaries. Agnes became known around the world as a diver, which wasn't a surprise since she always went into deeper cave systems in Australia and Florida. She went diving in places no one else had been before, and she was always successful. In her work as a diver and maritime archaeologist, she was also a public speaker and an author. Agnes' life showed that she worked hard at what she loved. Agnes did an internship with the Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program, LAMP, which was the research house of the Street Augustine Lighthouse and Museum in Street Augustine, Florida, during the summer of 2007. Agnes helped dig up old shipwreck sites to find out more about them. This job got her into diving in Florida, where she explored large cave systems. Agnes became more and more obsessed with going into caves because she was always drawn in by the sight of unknown passages and where they led. She was known for going on adventures, making maps of new cave systems, pushing the limits, and most importantly, bringing pictures back from her trips. She showed these pictures to the world so that people could see what they couldn't see with their own eyes. Agnes Maloka, who graduated from Gliders University, became interested in cave diving when she saw a hole at the bottom of Piccaninny Ponds near Miki Gambier in 2004. The Elk River Streamway cave system was explored by Angs and James Arundale. It has passages that are 4,600 feet, 1,400 meters, long. This cave could become the longest place where a stream flows continuously in Victoria, Australia. 
Agnes held the record for the longest cave dive by a woman in Australia until 2009 when she reached the halfway point of Craig Challenge's 2008 line on an expedition near Cocklebiddy. In 2008, she worked for TV stations like Discovery Channel Japan and the National Geographic Nova TV Expedition. And in 2009, she was part of a group that went to Queensland, Australia to look for sinkholes. Agnes helped take pictures during the National Geographic magazine trip to the Bahamas Caves. She strung more than 13,000 feet, 4,000 meters of line through several cave systems, with baptizing spring being the most important Eka mission. Between Peacock Springs and Baptizing Spring, she and James Tolan added more than 9,800 feet, 3,000 meters. Because it was her passion, she started a TV show called Agnes Maloka Project, in which she showed underwater cave footage shot by Wed Smiles and Cars Productions. During the making of James Cameron's movie, she taught the actors how to cave dive. In 2011, she was named a Dive Right Ambassador. And finally, she worked as a diving supervisor for the fashion label Tgari MAPE in their short film Bartha. In honor of her death, the movie was named after her. Agnes talked to a Polish radio station before the incident in the tank cave. When asked if the death of a fellow diver made her a little bit nervous, she said, I'm not afraid to dive. Anyone at any point can pass away. So you should live every day as if it could be your last. I really enjoy diving and I don't think anything will stop me from doing it. There are risks though. Every extreme sport has its own risks. It doesn't always work out, but you do everything you can to not only do that one dive, but to keep diving for many years. After all, and that's what it's all about, living long. You have to dive safely, but live as if every day is going to be your last. Even though she was afraid of dying, she didn't let that stop her from doing what she loved, and she stayed true to herself until her last breath. Many people would think Agnes had never been to the tank cave before after hearing about the bad thing that happened. It wasn't, however. She had explored the tank cave several times in the past, and she also wrote about the cave's system, calling it the crowing jewel of all the caves in the region. She said, though, that the cave's system was so complicated, it was like a spider web gone crazy. This, in essence, was to warn intending cave explorers to be extremely careful while navigating the tank cave. During her expedition to Tank Cave, which she tweeted about on Friday, February 25, 2011, Agnes was exploring the extensive labyrinth of caves. Agnes ran out of air and died because she had lost her way. Her body was found about 550 meters from the entrance, 66 feet underwater in a tight part of the cave. She was not trapped when she died, though. Agnes died because she stirred up mud from the walls and floor of the cave when she lost her diving buddy. It was as if she remained calm until her last breath while she was trying to extricate herself. She couldn't see anything and couldn't get out of the cave until she ran out of air. Her death could also have been a result of her aggression in the winding and narrow tunnels after diving into a very narrow, rocky passage, which took divers about an hour to reach. She was left alone because the place she dove into couldn't occupy two divers at a time. However, it is not against the rules to dive by yourself under certain conditions. On Sunday, February 27, at about 1.45 p.m., the person was reported missing. Before they could find her body, her fellow divers had to work very hard. The retriever team had hoped that they could find her body without drilling through the ground above, as some people had suggested. The entrance to the cave gave the divers a hint about how to pair up. They positioned emergency tanks along the path they found to their deceased friend. The retriever team, which included her diving buddy, Dr. Harris, found her body about 1,970 feet, 600 meters, into the cave system, several hours after the missing report. Two men went scuba diving at Little Springs River on November 26, 2003. Although they were both very familiar with this cave system, they encountered problems and ended up in a terrible scenario while diving. If you like our cave diving films but haven't subscribed yet, why not? Please think about following our channel. In the northern portion of Florida in the Spring Country region is Little River Springs. Approximately 125 acres of land are occupied by it in the Suwannee River County Park. In contrast to the Suwannee River's tea-colored water, the Little River Springs is transparent. They differ in temperature as well. The Little River Springs offers a variety of leisure activities, including the well like snorkeling, swimming, canoeing, kayaking, and scuba diving that attracts many divers. One of North Florida's most well-liked cave diving locations is Little River. The well-known Devil's Eye and Devil's Ear and other locations including Peacock and Cow Spring are all close to the cave. The spring is roughly 150 feet long and contains a 1,200-foot-long cave system. You'll find a few bypasses and offshoots in addition to the one main tunnel, 27 to 30 m. One of the cave's most remarkable features can be found inside the first 100 feet, 
When you descend an underwater corkscrew to reach the main room, you will find that the cave's system changes as you progress farther inside. Compared to the beginning of the cave, which has enormous stone tunnels and pure water, it gets larger and lower and has more silt covering its walls and flooring. The well casing is visible if you can scuba dive all the way to the end of the cave. Here, you can observe a man-made well that a farmer dug into the spring to enjoy the spring's sparkling water. Jerry Duane Beats, 42, and his uncle Kane Overfield went diving in Little River Springs on November 26, 2003, the day before Thanksgiving, 46 years old. Jerry and Kane were both qualified cave divers with years of expertise. Jerry even held a diving instructor certification. Up to 20 times have they previously dove into the Little River Springs cave. They only anticipated an 80-minute dive for this one. In the middle of the day, they each began their dive while using their scooters, also known as Diver Propulsion Vehicles DPV. The scooters are utilized to extend their underwater range. Additionally, scooters help divers move between different dive sites more quickly and save more oxygen. They had to use the primary gold line, which is close to the 100 feet arrow, to dive into the water body. Divers can access the top, middle, or bottom of the chimney through a number of shortcut tunnels. Jerry and Kane agree to monitor their air using the third's guidelines while they resume their dive. Divers will utilize one-third of the air to enter the cave, one-third of the air to exit the cave, and one-third of the air for emergency use if necessary. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this concept, therefore, once either of them used up one-third of their air, Kane and Jerry would begin returning to the surface. They reasoned that in order for this to occur, they must have reached well casing. They both knew that even though getting to the well casing is dangerous, a diver once drowned after doing so in March 2003. Although Jerry and Kane were both qualified divers with experience, it's possible that something happened to him because he was unskilled. To prevent this, they knew what to do at the well casing. Little River only has one main tunnel, as was previously mentioned. Following the main route, divers can choose to enter the merry-go-round or serpentine tunnels when they reach 900 feet below the surface. But both tunnels come together in the large Florida room. They had to take the permanent line down a sharp left and turn into the cave in order to reach the well casing. Visibility must be kept up as they descend further to prevent becoming lost. To continue, they had to dive through the dome room's lower portion and over a sizable sand breakdown pile. This part of the path is covered in a thick layer of mud and silt, as opposed to the stony passageways they passed through earlier. Divers must park their scooter to side after bringing them all the way down to this area and turning them off. Without it, they will carry on with their journey. Before Kay noticed that his nephew Jerry had stopped following him, they were heading in the direction of this well casing. He continued on for another 200 to 300 feet or so before realizing he was alone. There was no sign of Jerry. Kane is perplexed because he could initially believe that Jerry was following him. He then made the decision to go back to the well casing and check to see if Jerry was present. When they reached the well casing, an unforeseen event occurred. The well casing was clogged with silt. Silt out in diving refers to the silt on the wall surface being disturbed, which significantly reduces visibility. Kane was unable to see much of anything. Kane did not pause for very long. He started scouring the mud for Jerry. After a little period of hunting, he came across Jerry and grabbed him. Kane thought Jerry appeared to be doing fine. But soon after, Kane let him go since he had to fix his scooter on the line. After accomplishing that, he attempted to grab his nephew once more, but Jerry had vanished. In the mud, he became lost. Kane entered the murky water to look for him even though he was unable to see him. He kept swimming through the mud until he reached the crystal clear waters. Kane began hammering on his tank in the hopes that Jerry would hear him and return to the crystal clear water. But after a time, he stopped banging. Jerry would have likely utilized the sound left before him and entered the spring, he reasoned. Kane began his decompression process before returning to the surface. To his greatest shock, Jerry wasn't what he first thought. He understood that Jerry had become lost in the mud. So he shouted for assistance to the diver who was close. Tommy Roberts, one of the cops at Little River Springs, was located by Kane. When they were about to start looking for Jerry, he had remained in the cave for an additional 45 minutes. Tommy found a few other divers and together, they started looking. Four divers went into the cave to look for him, but they came up empty-handed. What was possible for Jerry? He was at the Florida room's end when they started his second search. One of the rooms inside the cave is called the Florida Room, and it was around 1,200 feet from the entrance. He appeared to be dead. He was given air by the search crew, but he ignored it. His fuel tank was empty. The rescue crew that entered the cave to retrieve his body and the two scooters was called by the Little River Springs Police. Jerry's scooter was located around 328 feet after the dome room, 
whereas Kane's scooter was discovered hooked to the line at the well casing. Jerry seems to have scuffed his scooter on the cave walls while attempting to exit. His scooter's entire body was covered in clay. Tommy added that if Jerry had been struggling with the scooter, the silt would have ended up on the propeller. This would have confused him, and since the silt had reduced visibility, he might not have been able to find his way out. During his final struggle to flee, Jerry must have been utterly terrified. Jerry couldn't get away and drowned. Jerry passed away, leaving behind a baby and his wife. Later, he was laid to rest the Catholic Church of Street John the Apostle. Jerry was clearly adored by his friends and family as seen by the attendants at his funeral. Another heartbreaking tale came to a devastating end when a cave diver who got lost in the silted cave perished. What, in your opinion, might Jerry have done differently in this circumstance? This was the first cave diving disaster marathon. Comment below with your thoughts and let us know. If you like what you saw, click the bell icon, like, and subscribe buttons to be notified when we upload another thrilling cave diving story.